It is certainly a privilege to be here with you today. I want to talk about what I think is the greatest challenge facing our country. I also want to basically tell you that I don't think Washington, D.C. yet gets it. And as I talk to you about the greatest challenge that faces our country, I want to talk about the importance of the energy industry. And I also want to talk to you about Louisiana and what we're doing to respond to this challenge. Here's the greatest challenge facing us as a people. We must not become the first generation of Americans that leaves fewer opportunities for our children and our grandchildren than we inherited from our parents. When you think about it, that's the American dream. Every generation has left more opportunities. Every child has known. If you work hard, you get a great education, you can do even better than your parents. Every generation of Americans has left that for their children. Yet we risk becoming the first generation that doesn't guarantee that for our children. Now, what do I mean by that? Surely we're in the middle of the greatest recession since the Great Depression. Now, I know in Washington, D.C., they'll tell you the recession's over. The recession's not over, with unemployment rates still above 9%. Recession is not over with foreclosure rates all over this country. But on top of that, what is the answer coming out of Washington, D.C.? They have borrowed $14 trillion in our name. Now, don't worry. They've got a plan. They want to almost double that borrowing to $26 trillion over the next decade. Kind of puts into perspective this whole debate in Washington about whether they should cut $33 billion or $61 billion they're going to borrow $26 trillion in our name. What does $14 trillion of debt mean? That means $45,000 for every American in our entire country. Look, you don't have to be a PhD in economics to understand we can't keep spending more than we take in. We know interest rates will go up, inflation will go up, the value of the dollar is going to go down. We know the Chinese won't keep buying our debt. Now add on top of all this, add on top of all this, even even 11 years into this new century, we still don't have a rational energy policy coming out of Washington, D.C. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't know about you, I was a little disheartened to hear the president's address at the State of the Union at the beginning of the year. Talked about our oil and gas industries as being yesterday's economies. And yet, just earlier this, a few days ago, just earlier this, this, this spring, he comes out and says now he's for increased domestic oil and gas production. It's amazing. He was against drilling before he was for it. Or maybe he was for drilling before he was against it. I can't keep up with this administration. Now, why is that so important? Well, certainly it's important in Louisiana. As an industry, you provide 15 16% of the wages paid in our state, tens of billions of dollars to our economy, but it's also important to our country. If you look at modern, uh, the modern economic history of our country, you look at the last six, seven recessions, nearly every single recession, in the post-war era has started with rising energy prices, has started with a lack of availability of energy. All of a sudden, Washington's paying attention because energy prices have gone up over $100 a barrel. All of a sudden, they're starting to pay attention because gasoline over $3 a gallon may be headed to $4 a gallon this summer. And so they think they can just flip a switch to turn on energy production. All of a sudden, they're worried because of the turmoil in the Mideast. They're worried about all the money we are sending overseas to countries that aren't always friendly to us. Now, where was this concern for this last year? Well, they haven't been issuing permits or allowing domestic production off of our coast. You know, what's so frustrating to me was when I was working with the administration in response to the oil spill, trying to hold them accountable, trying to hold the federal government accountable, trying to get resources to protect our coast. At one point, I expressed frustration to the president directly. I said, Mr. President, you understand your moratorium is going to kill thousands and tens of thousands of jobs in the same communities you're trying to help. His response stunned me. He said, Governor, don't worry about it. If people lose their jobs, BP will pay them. I said, Mr. President, with all due respect, I don't think BP is going to pay all those people. He said, well, don't worry about it because they can get an unemployment check. I think that summarizes exactly the difference between Washington, D.C. and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In Washington, D.C., they think economic development means an unemployment check. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we understand economic development means putting our people back to work. Our people don't want an unemployment check. They want to go back to work, and our country needs them to go back to work. Indeed, my frustration was only compounded when talking to Valerie Jarrett, and she told me, she said, Governor, don't worry about it. She said, as long as there's oil down there in the Gulf, those rigs aren't going to go anywhere. It's like she didn't understand they were mobile. 
It's like she didn't understand they ran out at half a million dollars a day. I don't need to tell you about the rigs that have already left for Brazil, for Africa, and other countries. The bottom line is we've got a national, a federal government that doesn't understand the energy industry. They don't understand that it creates tens of thousands of good paying, high tech jobs. They don't understand <clears throat> that it is an industry that involves billions of dollars of capital investments, multiple years to make drilling decisions, and we can't simply turn this industry on and off with a light switch. And that's why I want to thank you for the great work you do in creating jobs and providing energy, not only for our state, but for our country. I want to share with you the story of one of the biggest economic development projects in our state's history. And it tells you why energy is so important, not only for Louisiana, but the entire country. A couple of weeks ago, the mayor of New Orleans celebrated that we had one of the best Mardi Gras in our state's history in terms of attendance. And I was thrilled. That's great for the tourism economy. But the Monday before Mardi Gras, something very, very important happened in our state. Dan D'Amico, the CEO of Nucor, came to Louisiana. He stood with me in St. James Parish. We put shovels on the ground as we broke ground for their newest steel plant anywhere in the world. Nucor is America's largest steel company. They've announced that they're going to spend up to $3.4 billion in St. James Parish. And they're literally going to hire up to 1,250 direct employees, paying them $75,000 before benefits. LSU did a study that said this will create up to 6,000 total jobs in the River Parishes area in our state. This will transform that part of the economy. It's one of the biggest economic development wins in our state's entire history. It'll be the largest, most modern, most integrated steel facility anywhere in the world. It was a great day for our state. But I want to tell you the story behind that day. More than three years ago, when I was first elected governor, I called up Dan, I called up the CEO of Newcorp to try to convince them that they should come and invest in Louisiana. I traveled to South Carolina to try to meet with him and visit his facilities and again try to convince him Louisiana was the best place for him to build his facility. By the end of 2008, he was convinced. He said, Governor, you've convinced me Louisiana is the best place in America for us to build our facility. He said, we're going to build right here. He said, as soon as you get us the permits, we're ready to go. We've already got the capital on our balance sheet. We don't need to borrow the money. It has nothing to do with the recession. We're ready to go. But, you know, shortly after that, we had an election. Not only did we have a new president, we had a Speaker Pelosi and a Senator Reid working with that new president. Shortly thereafter, the CEO flew down to Baton Rouge to meet with me personally. He said, Governor, I've got to apologize to you. He said, I told you we were ready to build. I told you if you got me the permits, we would go. He said, given this new group in D.C., given the debate about cap and trade, he said, I'm still convinced Louisiana is the best place for us to build in America. But he said, now I'm thinking we might have to build in Brazil instead. It took two long years of constant discussions to finally convince Newcorp to come back and build in St. James Parish in Louisiana instead of going to Brazil. He was so worried about the cost of the cap and trade legislation that he was willing to send billions of dollars and thousands of jobs to another country. Now, somebody's going to have to explain to me how it is good for our economy and our environment to send those billions of dollars and thousands of jobs overseas. And what worries me is that for every new core we know about, there are dozens of other companies with literally trillions of dollars of capital sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what Washington's going to decide when it comes to issues and rules like the cap and trade legislation. What are they going to do about fracking rules and our shell formations? What are they going to do about taxes? What are they going to do about regulatory permits to allow us to access domestic forms of energy? Indeed, I had a meeting with the president with the other governors earlier this year, and I was waiting my turn. I was trying to ask him a question about the permitting process off the coast. That same day, I met with Secretary Salazar, and he promised me that they would go quickly to prove many, many permits. We've seen that hasn't happened. We've seen, I think, they're up to eight now. And that is barely a trickle when you consider the activity that was happening off the Gulf before, before the moratorium started. And as I was getting ready to ask the president my question, a bunch of governors came to me and said, now, Bobby, don't just ask about oil and gas, ask about coal. Because it turns out they're not processing coal permits either. It's not just an oil and gas issue. They're slowing down domestic energy production across this entire country. And let me tell you, as a state, we fully support alternative and a diverse set of domestic energy production right here in America. For example, right here in Lake Charles, we've got the Shaw Group with their modular construction facility. They're going to hire up to 1,400 people to build their modular components for nuclear power plants. 
We've got over in New Orleans. We've got Blay Dynamics. They're going to hire 600 people to build the components for wind power. And across the state, we've got, for example, the country's first biodiesel refinery over in Ascension Parish, taking food waste products, turning it into diesel, first of its kind. We've got here in southwest Louisiana research about the second, third generation of ethanol generation to use sugarcane waste products like big gas to, to refine and turn that into fuel as well. We fully support alternative and renewable energies. We fully support conservation. But as a state, we also understand this. We understand there is no practical bridge to a modern economy. There's no practical bridge that includes manufacturing in this country without oil and gas. And really, the only decision we've got to make is, do we produce more of that oil and gas at home? Or do we continue to send billions and billions of our dollars and thousands of our jobs overseas, often to countries that aren't friendly to us? And so my first point I wanted to share with you today, we are in the middle of the greatest recession since the Great Depression. We as a country have fundamental decisions to make about whether we want to continue a manufacturing economy in this country, whether we want to export, continue to export good paying jobs overseas like the jobs Nucor is creating in Louisiana, or, or whether we want to keep those jobs at home. And Dan said something very important to me. He said, Governor, one of the key one of the key facts that has changed my mind about building in America again has been the supply of natural gas. It's without the shale formations in Louisiana, Texas, Pennsylvania, it would be cost prohibitive, cost prohibitive for many of us manufacturers to continue to operate in America. So the first point I want to make is not only to thank you for the great job you do creating billions of dollars of wages and jobs in our state, but to also thank you for the important role you play in helping to power the American economy. It's not just higher gasoline and oil prices. It's whether we have a manufacturing base or whether we move all those jobs overseas. And I'm here to tell you, we can't be a superpower. We can't continue to have the best economy in the world if we no longer make things right here in America. And it is important for us to be able to compete for those high-tech, high-paying jobs like Nucor's and other companies and to keep those jobs in America. Now, the second point I want to make with you is the second part that Washington doesn't get. The first part they don't get is we don't have a rational energy policy. We also don't have a rational fiscal policy. Remember I told you they got $14 trillion of debt. They want to almost double that to $26 trillion. Here in Louisiana, we've done something different. You may remember on Inauguration Day, I made a promise. Over three years ago, I promised we'd stop exporting our greatest assets. Our greatest exports haven't been our crops, our food, our oil, our, ga our gas. Our greatest exports have been our children. For 25 years, for 25 years, we have been the only state in the South that has consistently sent more of our kids to other states more quickly than they moved back home. I promised you that day that we had to create a new Louisiana to bring our children and grandchildren home, the way to turn this state around. Well, I want to share with you five different decisions we have made since Inauguration Day. The first, we had a special session on ethics within our first 30 days in office. Now, why was that so important? Let's be honest. Everybody in Louisiana has got their favorite joke about Louisiana politicians. I went on national TV and I stole Billy Tozan's old joke. He was the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee before he left Congress. He used to joke about his home district in Louisiana. He'd say, look, at any given moment in time, he'd say half my people are underwater, the other half are under indictment any given moment in time back home in Louisiana. And people in Washington would laugh and just say, that's the Louisiana way of doing business. The problem was LSU had done a study. They surveyed business leaders, 950 of them across the country. They said the number one thing you can do, number one thing you can do to attract investment is to crack down on corruption. As long as people think who you know is more important than what you know, they don't want to invest in Louisiana. That is why we have enacted some of the country's toughest ethics laws, we moved from 44th worst to number one in the entire country, according to the Center for Public Integrity. We moved from the bottom five to the top five, according to the Better Government Association's Integrity Index. But we didn't stop there. Because this wasn't about ratings or rankings. This was about creating jobs. The second thing we did, we had a second special session. We got rid of the taxes on debt, new equipment, utilities. Later that year, we enacted the largest income tax cut in our state's history. Now, why is all of that important? Well, you don't have to be a PhD in economics to understand this. If you want to encourage an activity, don't tax it. If you want to discourage an activity, tax it. None of our neighboring states had those taxes on businesses when they borrowed money, when they bought new equipment, when they expanded. 
So basically, businesses were telling us it was more expensive to create jobs in Louisiana. They told us their newest equipment in Louisiana was older than their oldest equipment in any of these other states. That's why we got rid of those taxes to level the playing field. But I want to spend a couple of minutes talking to you about this issue because I think it may be the most important challenge and question and issue facing every governor and every elected official in Washington, D.C. Because we've gone beyond just cutting taxes. Steve's exactly right. I made a strong commitment as a candidate and as governor saying as long as I'm your governor, we are not raising taxes in the state of Louisiana. Now, why is that so important? Every single governor, every single elected official in Washington, D.C. has one fundamental decision to make. During a recession, during tough times, do we tighten our belts? Do we cut government spending? Do we do more with less in our state and national capitals? Or do we shift this burden to our families and businesses with higher taxes? I'm going to share many statistics with you showing that Louisiana is doing better than the national and southern economies, but I'm also here to tell you this. There's still too many Louisiana families looking for good paying jobs. And it doesn't make any sense to shift this burden to them. Already here in Louisiana, already in our state's capital, we've heard legislators talk about proposals to do things like, let's just raise income taxes. Let's just raise oil and gas taxes. Let's take away the exemptions and the different rules. One idea would raise taxes almost $200 million just based on suspending the exemptions on horizontal drilling. They've suggested things like raising taxes on hospital beds. And I've made it very clear to them. I said, any proposal that suspends a tax exemption that raises taxes, I will veto and I'll veto any budget proposal that tries to spend money from any one of those tax increases or suspensions of tax exemptions. Now, in Baton Rouge, we've had to cut government spending. We've cut government spending 26% since I've been governor. With our new budget, we will have cut spending $10 billion. We've eliminated with this new budget 10,000 government positions. We've sold off 10% of the state's car fleet. We've done things like privatized services like our group homes. It used to cost us $600, $500, $600 a day to operate those services. Private sector could do it for $200 per day. I proposed a budget to the legislature for the upcoming year that doesn't cut higher education, doesn't cut the MFP formula for K-12. through Indeed, we've grown that 6% since I was governor, and this will grow at 8%. We haven't cut our private health care providers. And we've cut the amount of one-time money in the budget by 75%. Yet even that's not enough for some. There are some that are still saying they are filing bills to try to raise taxes and get rid of those tax exemptions. But let's be very clear. For those that want to raise taxes, there will never be enough money. We don't have a revenue problem in Baton Rouge or Washington, D.C. We've got a spending problem. You know, there was a, a famous saying from Senator Long. He was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee in Washington, D.C. I don't know if it originated with him or his famous father or his uncle. He used to always say, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. And that seems to be the attitude of too many of our politicians in our state and national capitals today. Too many of our elected leaders, they'll try to convince you, well, don't worry. We're not going to tax you, we're just going to tax the wealthy. Don't worry. We're not going to tax you. We're just going to tax people when they go to the hospitals. Don't worry. We're not going to tax your company. We're just going to tax the folks drilling in the Haynesville Shale. The problem is that it may not be you today. It will be you tomorrow. The problem is that the people that want to raise taxes simply don't want to do the hard work to cut government spending. The people that want to raise taxes don't understand there has never been a state or country that has ever taxed, spent, or barred its way into prosperity. And we're certainly not going to become the first. The third thing we have done, in addition to making the commitment we're not raising taxes and cutting spending, the third thing we've done, we have continued to invest in workforce training. Seventy percent of the companies want to move or expand in Louisiana. Tell us one of their top two concerns is finding a skilled worker. That's why we now have a day one guarantee, saying our people will be ready to work on the first day or we'll retrain them for free. That's why we've invested over half a billion dollars expanding our technical and our community colleges. It's also one of the reasons we now have the top-ranked Fast Start workforce training program in the entire country. Louisiana Fast Start's been named the number one program in the entire country. It's one of the reasons. Gardner Denver Thomas moved hundreds of manufacturing jobs from Wisconsin into Monroe. It's one of the reasons company after company has said they're choosing Louisiana for their expansions, their investments, one of the reasons they're staying in our state. The fourth thing we've done, we continue to improve education in our state. 
Now I could talk to you about the Value Added Assessment Act to make sure that we reward teachers who raise children before, below grade level to above grade level. The Red Tape Reduction Act that allows schools to decide without coming to Baton Rouge whether they want to waive the bureau, bureaucratic rules as long as they can show students are learning. Or the letter grade bill that actually gives parents meaningful information about how their children's schools and teachers are doing so they know whether their kids are getting the education they deserve. But really, perhaps the most important bill we've done for K-12 education has been our Teachers' Bill of Rights. You know, we have not cut the MFP. We continue to pay our teachers at or above the Southern average. Yet when you talk to teachers today, they will tell you the number one reason they're leaving the classroom. It's not pay. The number one reason they're leaving the classroom is the lack of discipline in our public classrooms. Look, I graduated from Louisiana's public schools. So did my wife. You can get a great education in Louisiana schools. But our schools aren't what we remember when we were growing up. You don't believe me? Go visit a classroom. When I was growing up, you have to understand, my dad was one of nine. Is one of nine. He was the only one of the nine kids to get past the fifth grade. So when I was growing up, we were more afraid of our parents than our teachers. My dad was determined we were going to get a good education. And so when we'd get in trouble in school, we'd beg our teachers, do whatever you want to us, just don't tell mom and dad what we did at school. Because if you went home and said you didn't do it, all that happened was you got spanked when you got home, and when your daddy got home, you were really in trouble. And if you tried to tell your parents you didn't do it, my dad would say, son, you may not have done this, but I know you got away with something else. He said, I'm going to spank you for that. We'll call it even. Don't worry about it. It's not like that in today's schools. You go visit the classrooms today, and the teachers will tell you the parents are yelling at them. I'm here to tell the parents, we passed great laws in our state saying if the kids don't want to learn, if they don't show up ready to behave, we'll take away their driving privileges. We'll require them to stay after school, and that's all great. But these laws won't do any good if our parents continue to make excuses for their children. I'm here to tell the parents in this room, we're not doing our children any favors by making excuses for them. There won't be there anybody there to make excuses for them when they grow up, when they leave school, they try to get a job in the real world. Now, the other bill we passed for education, one of the most important bills, the Louisiana Grad Act. It gives higher education more resources, more flexibility, in return for better accountability. I don't know if you realize this, but we have had the second highest dropout rate in, our, in the entire South in our universities. That means we got the second lowest graduation rate. Even after six years, over 60% of those kids are dropping out before they graduate. Now, whenever you raise these kinds of numbers, you hear all kinds of excuses about why our kids aren't learning and they can't learn and they can't graduate, and it's all nonsense. I'm here to tell you, if states like Alabama, Mississippi, and other states we compete with in the South, if they have figured out how to educate their children, we should be able to educate ours. Let's put it a different way. If we had the second worst football program in the SEC, you would all want me to fire the coach. I mean, think how much pressure there was for the Tigers just to win the Cotton Bowl. Imagine if the coach got up and said, well, don't worry about it. It's just because the other kids in the other states are bigger, faster, and they just play football better than we do. We wouldn't take those kinds of excuses. If we're not willing to accept excuses on the football field, we shouldn't accept excuses in the classroom and our research laboratories either. And that brings me to one of the most controversial things I've asked the legislature to do this year. We have a regular session that will be starting to almost two weeks, a little bit, about two and a half weeks from now. We'll be starting the Monday after Easter. And I've asked them to look at higher education in New Orleans. Let me tell you, I want to talk to you for a couple of minutes about why I did this and why this is so important to me. We've got two public colleges, two public universities in the city of New Orleans, the University of New Orleans and the Southern University of New Orleans. They are literally blocks apart. Both of these schools have lost thousands of students since Katrina. Both of these schools use their buildings less than 50% of the time. At the same time, we've got a public community college in New Orleans called Delgado. As recently as last year, they were bursting at the seams, turning students away because they didn't have enough space in their buildings on their campuses. And so I asked the Board of Regents to look at these two schools, these two four-year schools, and say, and look and see whether it makes sense to combine them, to require them to work more closely together, and then to collaborate with Delgado. And here was the kicker for me. Suno, the Southern University of New Orleans, has the lowest graduation rate in our entire state. 
When compared to its peers, the lowest graduation rate compared to its peers. After six years, only 5% of its students were graduating. Now, I do want to be fair to the other side. After I first proposed this idea, Suno's defenders came out of the woodwork and they said, Governor, that's not right, that's not fair, and they got some more recent data. They now say their graduation rate after six years is no longer 5%, it is 8%. I told them, I'll be generous, let's round it off at 10%. That's still not acceptable for our students and taxpayers. Louisiana ranks 13th worst in the country. We spent over $200 million last five, six years of taxpayer dollars on kids dropping out with a year or less of education. It's not good for students. They end up with debt without the degrees they need, without the skills they need to get good paying jobs. It's not good for our taxpayers. Board of Regents hired a national consultant. They did a multi-page report, dozens of pages. I'll share just one paragraph with you. They said this. They said the current situation is unacceptable, is unacceptable to the students and the community in Southeast Louisiana. But they also said this. They said there's no reason to expect the status quo will change given the current management and operations. So people that say, let's just give it more time, give it more money. Our kids only grow up once. Now let me put it a different way. If in business you failed 92% of the time, you probably wouldn't stay in business very long. Now, the Regents recommended a consolidation. We're providing legislation to the legislature this year. It'll take a two-thirds vote in the House, a two-thirds vote in the Senate to get this done. People have asked me, Governor, why in the world would you do this in election year? Why in the world would you do this this year? This is the kind of thing you do after you get reelected. Why would you do it this year? I'm here to tell you. Across the country, in state capitals across this country, and in our nation's capital, any governor any elected official in D.C. that tells you, no, we're not going to make the tough choices this year. Just wait till next year. They're lying to you. Given the fiscal challenges this country faces, now is the time for us to make the tough choices in terms of how are we more efficient? How do we better deliver services? How can we cut wasteful spending? So if we're not willing to do this this year, we as a state will never, never be willing to make the tough decisions. Fifth and finally, we've invested in our infrastructure. $3.6 billion. We did more in our first 18 months for roads and ports. The last three administrations did combine during that same time period. And I could go on and on in terms of different laws and things we've done, but it really comes down to five simple steps. Ethics laws, stronger ethics laws, cutting taxes while we cut spending, revamping our, our, our workforce training programs, investing and improving education, and investing in our infrastructure. The bottom line is results. 39,500 new jobs. Eight and a half billion dollars in capital investment. Five months in a row and counting were year over year job gains. This past month, our best, best, best month for job growth since the hurricanes. Not only that, you look at all the national rankings. Site Selection Magazine ranked Louisiana the number one state in the entire country for per capita economic development. We also ranked us the most improved state in the country. Paulina ranked us the most improved state in the country. Portfolio.com said we're the second best economic performance since the recession. But Gallup says we're the third best state in creating jobs. Moody says we're one of the first 11 to leave the recession. Fifth best GDP growth. Our unemployment rate has been below the national and the southern average every single month for the last three plus years. Southern Business Development said we were the state of the year in the south two years in a row for per capita economic development. And again, the list go on and on. Business facilities named us the state of the year. But here's the most important number. After 25 years of losing our children, for the last three years in a row, we've had more people move into Louisiana more quickly than they're leaving. That means we've finally begun, we've finally turned the corner in terms of reversing that brain drain. Now, we can't declare victory until every child returns home, but it means we're no longer, we're no longer as we have for the last three decades, exporting our greatest assets. Now, again, we can't declare victory until every child comes home and every child is able to find a job without having to leave for these other states. But I'm here to tell you the decisions we make in Washington, the decisions we make in Baton Rouge and in Austin and our other state capitals, they matter. Just as the moratorium has hurt our economy, just as our decision to cut taxes has helped our economy, the decisions our elected leaders make are important. Now, people ask me, why is this so important to me? Why have we been so laser focused on job creation? Well, if you haven't done this in a while, I invite you to go to your next reunion. You know, if you haven't been to a reunion, my wife and I, we've been to our reunions the last few years. 
If you haven't been in a while, you'll notice a couple of things. First thing you'll notice is how much older everybody else looks in the room. It's amazing. I'm sure we haven't changed at all. They all look. But the second thing I noticed when I went to my reunion was how many of my friends no longer live in Louisiana. How many of my friends had to come back from Georgia and Texas and other states? Indeed, indeed, many of my friends left during the last big recession that hit our state. They left during the oil bust of the 80s, and they never came back. I don't know about you, but I don't want my children and grandchildren, I don't want them to have to fly home for their reunions. Too many of our families only see their children and grandchildren at Easter, at Christmas, and the holidays, instead of watching them grow every day, instead of being a part of their lives every week. And that is why this is so important to me. I know we've got a lot of visitors from Texas, and I'll share with you the first time I ever ran for any public office. I was leaving the Bush administration. The president was very gracious. We were on Air Force One. He just offered me a great opportunity to move in the West Wing and to work more directly for him. It was a wonderful opportunity, but I, I had to tell him that I was coming back home to Louisiana. I was trying to explain to him my rationale. I said, Mr. President, in the last couple of years, there was actually a year back then where the superintendent, the principal, and the teacher of the year in Texas had all come from Louisiana. I was trying to explain to him, we as a state can't afford to keep exporting so many of our best and brightest. He smiled and looked at me and said, well, Bobby, as a former governor of Texas, I just want to thank you for sending all those people to Texas. I said, no, sir, that's not the point. We want them back. The reason this is so important, the reason it's so important you continue to fight to provide the energy to power our country, the reason it's so important we all fight together against higher taxes and ridiculous regulations is that that is the only way we can leave a better future for our children and grandchildren. Now, I could talk about other federal policies that threaten our economy. Here in Louisiana, we've seen the Navy cost us 5,000 jobs at Northrop Grumman's facility in Avondale. We've seen NASA's decision cost us 2,500 jobs at Michoud. We could talk certainly about uh, the moratorium that eight to 12,000 jobs the federal government estimates they've killed. We know it's a lot more than that. We can certainly look at the, the many decisions, whether it's cap and trade or the other regulations that are scaring businesses from investing and creating jobs right here in America. But the bottom line is this. I still think our best days as a state and as a country are ahead of us, not behind us. And what gives me the faith to tell you that it's not our government. What makes us the greatest country in the history of the world, it's not our government, it's our people. Our founding fathers got it right. They believed in a limited federal government. They understood the larger, the bigger the federal government was, the less liberty, the less freedom we have as people. And what made that experiment over 200 years ago so incredible was they trusted the genius, the collective wisdom of the American people. They knew if they could get government out of our way, we would create a safer, more prosperous country. And they also knew that a stronger America, it was important for us, but it was important for the world. A stronger America is good not only for us as Americans, it's good for the entire world. The entire world needs America to lead. So I don't want, as I'm closing down my remarks, I don't want anybody to think I am pessimistic about the future of Louisiana or America. We've continued to outperform the country and the region. We'll continue to do that. But I continue to believe our best days are ahead of us. I continue to believe that we won't become the first generation that mortgages our children's future, but instead we'll correct the ship and leave more opportunities for our children and grandchildren than we inherited from our parents. I'll close with one final story. You now I talk about my kids a lot, and it really is the reason it's so important for us to keep fighting these fights. I don't know about you, but my kids, my kids right now, they're nine, six, and four. They're at that age where they've got certain traditions and rituals. You know, they get home from school every day in the afternoon. They come home, they usually eat a snack, they'll go, they'll do their homework. If they've got any, they'll go outside and play. Around 6, 6.30, we'll call them in, they'll eat dinner. After that, they go and take their baths. The nine-year-old's a girl, the boys are six and four. It is amazing, you've got to watch those boys. They can get in and out of the bathtub, and I swear to you, it's, it defies the laws of physics, they don't even get wet, it's amazing. They get in there, and they come out dirtier than when they started, I don't know how they do it. My little girl, she scrubs herself so clean, you would think she's going into surgery. She's just, you know, she's very, very deliberate. The boys, not so much. And then after they've taken their baths, they'll go brush their teeth. They put on their pajamas, they go brush their teeth. 
The boys might play a little bit more, throw a football around. The little girl, she has, if she has any last-minute homework, she'll do that. Then they'll say their prayers before they go to bed. One of my favorite moments every night is listening to my little kids pray. You know, every night, our little kids, they'll say the Lord's Prayer out of the Bible, and then when they're done with that, we let them pray to God however they want. It's just a magical time. You, you learn so much listening to your children praying. You know, they complain to God. They tell God what's going on. They thank God for their grandparents, and they just tell them about their day. It's just a wonderful, wonderful time. I remember one night I was kneeling down. My little boy was three years old. We were saying our prayers together. He says the Lord's Prayer when he gets to the end. He does this every night, says the Lord's Prayer. But tonight he did something different. He got to the end. He didn't stop. He didn't take a breath. He didn't even pause. Instead, he launched right into the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, I didn't know what to do. I was on my knees. Are you supposed to put your hand on your heart? Are you supposed to stand up? I mean, what do you do? I didn't know what to do, so I just, I, I waited till he was done, and when he was done, he yelled, amen, at the top of his lungs. He was so proud of himself. I just yelled, amen. I didn't know what else to do. I was confused until a few days later, I realized he goes to a Christian daycare, and every morning, they start their day with the Lord's Prayer, and then they say the Pledge of Allegiance. In his mind, he thought it was just one long prayer. He didn't understand there were two different things. And then finally, before they go to bed, we try to teach our kids to read a little bit before they go to bed. It's just good for them to learn how to read and, and, and kind of broaden their horizons. My little girl loves to read. She reads dozens and dozens of books every year. It's amazing. She's been a great reader. My boys, not so much. The six-year-old boy, unless it has to do with the New Orleans Saints or the LSU Tigers, he's not reading it. Unless it's about sports, he just doesn't care. We've already got him his own subscription of Sports Illustrated just to get him to read something. He just, he has no interest in reading books. So one night I was kind of surprised. We were going to bed and he found a book with his name on it. And he was so excited. He said, Daddy, I want you to read me this book. And he had somehow found this old King James version of the Bible that had been given to us when he was born. It's one of those beautiful ceremonial Bibles, had his name in gold letters on the top cover. And I thought, He's not going to want me to read. I mean, this is tough language for a child. I mean, he's not going to be interested in this. But he asked, so I opened it to Genesis 1, and I start reading it to him. And to my surprise, he loved it. He loved the language. He loved me explaining the stories to him, and it was great. I mean, the kids had all kinds of questions about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. It was going great. I thought, well, this is great. He's, he's enjoying reading. He's learning new words. I mean, what could be bad about this? And a few nights later, he finds a children's version of the Bible that had been given to him. He says, Daddy, you read to me out of the big person's book, and I'll read to you out of the children's book. So that became our little tradition. Every night, I'd read a little bit more to him out of the Bible, and he'd read to me out of his little children's book, and it was a wonderful thing. Well, I don't make it home every night before my kids go to bed. Some nights I make it home. By the time I'm there, they're, by the time I get back from the last meeting, they're already asleep. And so one night, I got home kind of late, and my wife was waiting for me almost at the door. She said, do you know what your children did today? <laughs> Word of advice to the men in the room. When your wife tells you, do you know what my children did today? They probably done something good. They probably, you know, got a good grade at school. They hit a home run. They did something good. When they're your children, that's never a good sign. When they were younger, when she said, do you know what your children did? That usually meant their diapers had to be changed or they'd been misbehaving. I even walked in. I was like, well, what? What did they do? And she said, well... You know, the boys were such angels. It's tough for one parent to have to take care of three kids at once. You're playing basically a zone defense. You know, put one in the bathtub, you're running after the other two. It's just, it's tough when there's three of them and only one of you. So all night long, she'd been struggling to get all three into bed, doing their homework, make sure they were behaving. She said the boys were angels tonight. They behaved, they cooperated. So when it was time to go to bed, you weren't here. So Sean, my six-year-old, he wanted to read to his younger brother. I said, well, that's great. She said, yeah, I went and worked with our daughter. I went and worked with Celia. I helped her with her homework. And I wasn't really paying attention. I let the boys read to the, each other when they went to bed. I said, well, what are you mad at me for? She said, do you remember where you left off when you were reading to Sean in the Bible? I said, sweetheart, I really don't remember. I mean, we probably got through about two, three chapters of Genesis. I don't remember how far we got. And she said, well, do you remember what happens in the third chapter of Genesis? I said, off the top of my head, no, not really. I said, I'll go look it up for you if you want me to. Give me a minute. Let me come inside. And she said, I wasn't paying attention. So right before they went to bed, your six-year-old boy, he read the story of Cain and Abel to his younger brother before they went to bed. 
I had to go wake my boy up and tell him he wasn't allowed to kill his brother, even though it was in the Bible. The reason it's so important we fight these fights, for me, it's because of my nine-year-old girl, my six-year-old boy, and my four-year-old boy. The reason it's important for you is because of those children at home, those grandchildren you're expecting, is so we can leave a better America and a better Louisiana for our children and grandchildren. Thank you for the billions of dollars you invest in our economy. Thank you for the tens of thousands of jobs you create, but more importantly than that, thank you for powering an even better America for our children and grandchildren. Thank you all very much for allowing me to come speak to you all today.